That said, let's get into the Word of God. On Sunday mornings, we're going now through 2 Corinthians, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We had just completed uh, 1 Corinthians, and so now we're in Paul's second letter to the church there in Corinth. Our text today will be verses 5 and 6 in chapter 1. Uh, I'll, uh, though, start back in verse 1 for the sake of context, but once you find your way there, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read, again, beginning back in verse 1. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace, verse 2, to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us, verse 4, in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For, verse 5, just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Let's pray. We'll ask God to bless this to our understanding, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, will you at this time, by your Holy Spirit, settle our hearts and enable us to focus our attention on you and your word in this portion that we have before us in your word today. Lord, we desperately need for you to speak in and through your word into our lives. We hunger and thirst for you to do this, knowing that only you can satiate the hunger and thirst of our souls. So, Lord, will you do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. So today's teaching is going to be part two of a series I've titled, What Trials Produce. One of the life-changing truths of the Christian faith, and I think you would agree with this, is that God allowing those fiery trials in our life are in order to accomplish his purpose for our life, whether we realize it or not, and moreover, whether we like it or not. Those trials that God allows in our life are for a purpose. God is doing something in our life, in and through those trials. But here's the thing this can actually create a problem especially when we as we're often prone to do misinterpret or misunderstand why it is that God has allowed the trial the reason for the trial and many a believer because of this is led to question the goodness of God God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? God, are you angry with me? God, are you punishing me? God, what is it that I've done that has caused your heavy hand to be on my life by way of this trial in my life? And we look at it that way, and to do so is to err greatly. Sadly, many unnecessarily experience a crisis of faith, which is usually what happens when we see the trial through the lens of a cruel 
or angry God. Just by way of a personal testimony, I've oftentimes shared that season in my wife's and my life where for 10 years we were unable to have children. And in my culture, if a woman is unable to have children, it was always seen as a curse <laughs> from God on the woman's life. And even throughout Scripture, we see this to be true. Modern day in the Middle East, that's the culture, is that if, if a woman can't have children, she is obviously cursed of God, and that's why. And there were no shortage of well-intentioned Christians. One has called them um, uh, fire-breathing dragons <laughs> who are well-intentioned and are there to and quick to tell you that the reason why you can't have children is because there's some deep sin in your life. Well, that doesn't help. And then you start feeding this notion that God is angry with you. God's curse is upon you. And because you're experiencing this trial, God must be angry with you. And oftentimes it's for this very reason that God in his love will actually allow us to go through those difficult trials, those difficult times of trial and testing. It's for that very reason. And I'll try to explain how I get there and why I say that. In and through the trial, God, as he's always so faithful to do, will reveal himself in new ways that we could have never otherwise seen absent the trial. And this is what the Apostle Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 4, I'll read verses 12 through 16. Listen very carefully. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed. Listen when his glory is revealed. Hang on to that. That's the purpose, by the way. That's the purpose for the trial. It's for God's glory and your betterment. I want to come back to that. In verse 14, he says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. <laughs> How many of us would honestly say that we're blessed when somebody insults us? You know, oh, you, you just insulted me. Oh, bless me some more, please. Really? You are blessed. <laughs> and here's why. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. The Apostle Peter here is echoing what the Apostle Paul says in the sense that fiery trials are to be seen as a badge of honor, if you will. But there's a prerequisite, and the prerequisite is if... You're suffering for Christ and not for your own stupidity. Uh, I'm sorry for saying it that way, but that's the truth of the matter. It reminds me of something that J. Vernon McGee once said in that cranky voice. I tell you, friends, you know, that cranky voice. You know, you, if you might be suffering because you're stupid. I <laughs> just... Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's why I'm suffering. <laughs> this trial that has come upon my life. God, what are you doing? God's a bigger, I had nothing to do with this. This was of your doing. You did this to yourself. And, and, and the reason is, is that this presupposes that we're not suffering the consequences of our own sin. And there are consequences for our own sin. And Paul just, or Peter just lists three of them. 
I mean, murder, that's a pretty big one. Uh, stealing, that's a pretty big one. And then he even lumps in and categorizes with stealing and murdering, gossiping, which is interesting. In other words, Christian, you're suffering, you're in a trial, you maybe need to ask yourself, is it because of something that I brought on myself? And that's the reason for my suffering? If that's the reason, that's a whole different ball game. That's a whole different ball game. Now here's the point. The point is, is that suffering for Jesus Christ or being persecuted because of Jesus Christ is for God's glory and for our betterment. If you can keep in mind in the midst of that trial that God in the end is going to be glorified in and through this trial that I'm in. And not only is God going to be glorified, I'm going to be bettered. God is working this out for my good, for my betterment, and that is the purpose of the trial. Here's the thing. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it. We, we want it to be sooner rather than later. <laughs> Lord, please. I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know the way. But by faith, I can know that he is going to be glorified in and through the trial that I'm in. Now, here's another thought. Many of the trials that we experience are likely because they're an answer to a very dangerous prayer that we prayed. You know what that prayer is? God, use me. Oh, do you know what you pray for? <laughs> it reminds me of a prayer early on. I'm a young believer. This is many, many years ago. And I just remember praying, God, teach me how to pray, knowing not what God's answer to that prayer would be. You know what his answer was? You want to learn how to pray? I'm going to give you two teenage boys. You'll learn how to pray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just, it's that old adage, be careful what you pray for. Well, how many of us have prayed, God, I want, to, I want to be used. I want my life to be used for you to further your kingdom, for your glory. Lord, use me in the life of others. Do you know what comes packaged with a prayer like that? Well, if I'm going to use you to comfort others, you're going to have to taste from the cup of my comfort when you go through a trial in order to speak into the life of that person that I'm going to use you in to comfort them. That's what Paul's saying. You, you want to minister to those who are suffering? Well, you need then yourself to suffer as well. And then in that suffering, you're comforted and ministered to by me, and then that qualifies you to minister to others for me. I think of Jacob. God's response to Jacob, and this guy, I can't wait to meet this man. I can't wait to meet a lot of these men and women of God. And by the way, if, as things are going, I think it's not going to be that long. <laughs> so I'm already preparing the introduction. Hi, my name. I know who you are. You do? <laughs> You're Noah, aren't you? Yeah. Wow, Noah. <laughs> that must be Jacob. Yes, how'd you know? <laughs> but I just, I, he was a very strong personality. And he wrestles with God all night long. He will not let the Lord leave until the Lord blesses him. And the Lord says to him, I can't bless you until I break you. Oh. I have to suffer in that way before you can bless me in that way. Here's what I'm getting at. God's response is that he can't bless us 
and use us until he first breaks us. And he breaks us so that we can, in fact, be used of him. I think of Jacob particularly, and there are many others as well, that were too strong in and of themselves for God to use, which is why God had to break them. I think of the Apostle Paul, in and of himself, a very strong man, a very strong-willed man, and God had to break him. And when God broke him, then God could use him. And this is why Paul can say, it's in my weakness that I am strong. I'm not strong in myself. I, I don't boast in my, my strength. I boast in his strength. And his strength came in and through and because of my weakness. And my weakness came because God in his grace, in his mercy, in his love broke me. The breaking always, always, always precedes the blessing. It cannot be the other way around. It's been my own personal experience in my walk with the Lord that God simply cannot use me until I have first been broken by the Lord. I think of A.W. Tozer. I, I have a love-hate relationship with the writings of A.W. Tozer. I mean, I, I remember uh, in a season of my life, I, I was uh, in my devotionals, uh, reading A.W. Tozer, and I, I just came to this point where I just I can't read this guy anymore. He's killing me, man. <laughs> and I mean, very blunt, very, you know, in your face, but very true. And one of his famous quotes was this. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Now, doesn't that just perk, perk your heart and bless your heart? And No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. We cringe at the very mention of pain and suffering. And what we don't realize is that when we chafe against it and fight against it, we are robbing ourselves of the blessing that always comes as a result. I think one of the most dangerous people in a church body is the one who's unbroken. I'll personalize it. I'll bring it more on myself. I think the most dangerous pastor behind any pulpit is a pastor who's never been broken. Whom God has never broken in this way. They've never tasted from that blessed cup of brokenness as distasteful as it is. They have never tasted from it, and because they've never tasted from it, they've never been the recipient of the blessing that comes as a result. The most dangerous Christian is an unbroken Christian. It's for this reason, I believe, that we have passages such as this one that's before us today, and really the many others like them, that deal with the issue of Christian suffering. This is a delicate matter. This is a touchy topic, if I can say it that way. The subject of Christian suffering. It's important to understand that our suffering as Christians isn't just for the sake of suffering. We, we don't suffer for the sake of being a martyr for the cause, Rather, it's for what the suffering will cause. You'll forgive my play on words, but by that I mean suffering causes me to seek the Lord. Let's be honest. When things are going well, am I really seeking the Lord? But let adversity strike, and I'm on my face. Oh, God, he's got my attention. This is Ecclesiastes 7.14. Solomon writes, and I'm going to paraphrase, when times are good and you're blessed and you're prosperous, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Don't 
apologize for it. God's blessing your life. Enjoy! You know there's a but coming, right? <laughs> you know how it is when you're talking with somebody and they're, and they're starting off like that, you know, praise the Lord, you know, and they go on and on, and then you know that but is coming, and then they, they say, but, you know, oh. but what? Well, Solomon writes, during times of prosperity and joy, but when, not if, when adversity strikes, I wish it said if, it doesn't, when adversity strikes, stop and consider and realize that God brings one alongside the other so that man will discover nothing about his future. In other words, God is going to bring adversity alongside of prosperity. He's going to bring trials alongside of triumph. And he does it for the purpose of you stopping so he's got your undivided attention. Because when things are going well, he doesn't have our attention. Think about your prayer life when things are going well. It's a very generic prayer. Lord, bless me, bless them, bless this, bless that. In Jesus' name, amen. And off I go. But boy, let adversity strike. I'm on my face before the Lord. I'm in the word of the Lord. And he's got my attention and I'm hanging on every word. I'm hanging on every word. And that's the purpose. Beloved, I, I hear God say, Beloved, you put your name in there. I'll just use my name. JD, my beloved JD. When you're caught up in the busyness, the cares and the affairs of life, I don't have your attention. And I miss that intimate time with you, my beloved. And the only way I'm going to get your attention is to allow this adversity to strike. That's when I have your undivided attention and with your undivided attention I also have that intimacy that whether you realize it or not you need. You desperately need. I was thinking in fact just this morning as I was getting ready to come how it is that Jesus, as busy as he was, always, and I mean always, made time to get alone with the Father. And you've heard, I'm sure, the convicting teachings as I have. If, what do you think, you're more, you're busier than the Savior of the world? If Jesus needed to do it, then how much more do you need to do it? I don't think, I don't, that, that's, that misses, really? It's, you mean it's a got to and not a get to? You mean I have to? It's not that I want to? I don't see it like that at all. I don't see God saying, you know, you haven't had a devotional time in a long time, so I'm going to let adversity strike. That's not who God is. If you think that's who God is, you are sadly mistaken. And if you view your God through that lens, then every trial in your life will be perceived in that way. That God is mad at you. He's trying to get my attention. No, no, no. He's wanting to get my attention because he longs for that intimacy as a loving Heavenly Father who loves us so much. And he misses us. He misses hearing our voice. One of the things as a, as a father, an earthly father, <laughs> As fallen as we are, dads. One of the things that just melts a father's heart is when their child comes to them. And, th and think of it this way. Could you imagine if your child came to you? i got to spend time with you, dad. Don't bother. Oh, I haven't, you know, spent time with you. I need to spend, you know, some time with you. <laughs> you know, really? No, don't bother. But how does it melt us so when they come to us, as they often do, and genuinely, spontaneously even, will want to be with us, talk with us. Nothing blesses my heart. There is, as a pastor, 
But as a father, nothing blesses my heart more than when my sons will come to me and say, Baba, I love it that they still call me Baba. <laughs> can, we, can we talk? I need to talk to you about something. Oh my goodness, I drop everything. I get the President of the United States on the phone. I'm, I'm, I never would have the President of the United States on the phone, but you know, just by way of, that was a horrible illustration, but I'm hanging up, man. I'm hanging up because my son is here. And I want to give him my undivided attention because it seems that now I've got his undivided attention. <laughs> and those are the richest times. And that's how I see it. That's how I see why it is that God allows us to experience those times of suffering, those times of testing, those times of trial. A life verse for many is Jeremiah 29, 11. You know this verse. I think it just sums it up beautifully, brilliantly, and even perfectly. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, the implication being you have no idea what I have planned for you. You have no idea. You don't have the foggiest idea what I'm planning for you. The plans I have for you. You know what they are? Beloved, <laughs> plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's, that's the plan. That's the purpose. From the hand of a loving, heavenly father. Think of it as earthly fathers again, even as earthly parents, how much do we want to bless our children? I remember when my boys were young and made me very old when they were young. <laughs> and I had to discipline them. And I remember one time, because it just seemed like that I was constantly disciplining them all the time. And I remember telling them, contrary to what you might believe, your mom and I don't get up in the morning and think about, man, I can't wait to discipline my boys. We're not looking. <laughs> that is never what our plan is. Our plan is quite the contrary. Our plan is, wow, I wonder how we can surprise them. Hey, let's surprise them and take them to the water park. That's, that's the plan we have to see the excitement on their face. That's the plan we have. We want to bless them. We don't want to harm or injure them. How many of us have said to our child before we discipline them, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you? And what child has ever believed that? <laughs> don't, well, I don't want you to hurt, so don't hurt me either. How's that? I do this because I love you. And this is true of our Heavenly Father who disciplines us because He loves us. He chastises those whom He loves. To which our response in the flesh is, don't love me so much then. <laughs> I don't want to be chastised. I tell my kids, in fact, my son the other day, so witty, smarty pants. I always have this joke with them. I say, you know, if I didn't care and I didn't love you, I would just say, yeah, go ahead and juggle knives on the H3. So the other day, my son's going to go surfing again. It's like a third time. One day he's going surfing. And he says, hey, Baba, I'm, I'm going. I know you want me to tell you because I know you care. I just want you to know I'm not going to go onto the H3 and juggle knives just so you're not, you know, worried. I think he got it. I, at least I hope he gets it. I love you. That's why I want to know where you're at. If, if I didn't, I wouldn't give a rip. Gosh, I don't care. Stay out all night. I don't care. One of the things that, and this is just the introduction, by the way. We'll get to our text. It's uh, <laughs> coming up here in a, another hour or so, but... 
one of the things I'm learning as a Christian first and a pastor second is that God will first prepare us for that which he prepares for us. And an example of that is Joseph, who went through such unspeakable pain and suffering for some 17 years as God was preparing him. The years of betrayal by his own brothers, false accusations of rape from his boss's wife, being forgotten in a dungeon. God was preparing him. Now, one would think that God was being cruel to him. No, God wasn't being cruel to him. You don't make somebody the most powerful man in the world save Pharaoh without preparing them first. He has to be broken, completely yielded and surrendered to me, and he has to trust me no matter what, because once I put him in that position from the pit to the pinnacle, as one said, he'll be ill-prepared if I don't. Had God not allowed him to go everything through everything he went through, think about it, it would be doubtful that God could have used him so profoundly and powerfully. He had to prepare him for that day when he would reveal his identity to his brothers. He had to prepare him and prepare his heart that could have become very bitter and resentful towards his brothers for what they did to him. And the only way he was able to do it was because he knew that God's hand was in it. God allowed it. Here's one of the lessons from Joseph's life, and there are many it's not what have they done to you. It's what is God doing and going to do in and through you by way of what they did to you. If I understand and again believe with all of my heart that it's for God's glory and my betterment, that settles it. Bitterness cannot exist in that climate. Bitterness cannot grow in that soil, the soil of knowing that God has allowed this for a purpose. He has a plan. I don't know what it is. I just know that it is by faith. And in Genesis 50, 20, perhaps amongst my favorite verses in all of the Bible... <laughs> When his brothers realize it's him, they are mortified. They, they know they're deserving of death. And what does Joseph say? What you meant for evil. God worked for good for the salvation of many this day. How could he say that? Because God had prepared him all of those years by allowing him to go through everything he went through. Well, let's get to our text in closing. <laughs> we have in verses 5 and 6 another reason that trials produce those needed preparations for God to use us. And it's that of patient endurance in the Lord. And keep in mind, this is in concert with both peace with the Lord and comfort from the Lord. In, in concert with that is this patient endurance. In verse 5, Paul says that just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ as well. And then in verse 6, he says, interestingly, if we're distressed, you know what it's for? You know what the purpose is? It's for your comfort and salvation. 
And here's the thing. This is what produces a patient endurance of the same suffering that we're suffering. Now, this happens to be one of those places in God's Word where knowing the original language is going to be germane to our understanding. I'm always uh, hesitant to get into the original Greek, but this is one of those cases where I think it is a must. The Greek word that Paul uses here for endurance is hupomone. I love that word. It's got a ring to hupomone. Almost you can put a, you know, <laughs> hupomone. Yeah. <laughs> it, I love that word. But anyway, that's my problem. So, but hupomone, <laughs> I digress, carries with it the idea of not just getting through it, not just enduring it, not just gutting through it, but being victorious over it. That's what the word means. It's not just, man, you just got to hang in there. And is that not how we're prone to see endurance and understand endurance? Man, just, you know, just hang in there, man. You'll get through this. I just need to endure. No, it's not just that. More importantly, it's being victorious over it. To see endurance only as getting through it is to miss the entire purpose of the trial that I'm enduring. It strips it. It strips it of the victory that can come from it. And that's what Paul is saying here when he says patient endurance. I like how one commentator said it. Endurance isn't the idea of passive, bleak acceptance, but of the kind of spirit that can triumph over pain and suffering to achieve the goal. And I love this. He says, it is the spirit of the marathon runner, not of the victim in the dentist chair. That's how I see endurance. It's like a root canal without Novocaine. i got to endure the pain. That's not what endurance is. It's triumph. It's victory. Does not God want us to live victorious Christian lives? Not defeated Christian lives? How many Christians live their lives in defeat unnecessarily? God wants us to be victorious triumphant. He wants us to walk in victory. This is what James says, and I know you know this as well, verses 2 through 4 and verse 12. And here again, it's almost comical if you don't understand it, because he starts by saying, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Really? Consider it pure joy, when I'm experiencing trials. I don't consider it pure joy. No, but I'm going to explain to you why you can consider it pure joy. Here's why, verse 3. Because, it's because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Patient endurance, if you will. And he says... Let perseverance finish the work. The, the implication being that I'm somehow hindering this perseverance from finishing the work that God has intended for it to finish in my life. If I'll let perseverance finish its work, then I will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Have you ever seen your trials as God supplying a need in an area that you lack? What do you mean? Well, I have to confess, I've been walking with the Lord for over 30 years, and one of the areas in my Christian life that I am still lacking is in the area of patience. There, I said it. I said it. I read through the list of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, meekness, goodness, kindness, gentleness, patience, and self-control. <laughs> Come on, like, like you don't have an issue with being patient. 
Don't look at me like that, all pious and smug. Wow, pastor, I didn't know. <laughs> Let's be honest with ourselves, shall we? That's the work that it's completing. That's the lack that it's supplying. And then in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In James chapter 5, it gets worse. <laughs> he says, verse 7, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains? I grew up in a very small farm town, Tico, Washington. Population, about 200 people. My graduating class, about 16 people. That was back in 1980. 16 people. Small farm town. I know what farming is. In fact, a lot of us in high school would work for these farmers during the summer, and if the harvest wasn't complete, they would actually delay the starting of school until the harvest was complete. And these farmers had to be patient as they waited. And what James is saying is, you too, be patient and stand firm. And here's why. Because the Lord's coming is near. How many of you are impatient concerning the Lord's return. Good. So a few people are honest. <laughs> I'll raise my hand. I want, the, I want the Lord to come back now. Now. He says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience, there it is again, in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. Don't you hate it when you're going through a trial and somebody brings up Job? Man, I, you just feel so unworthy and carnal and... Start questioning your salvation, the patience of Job. Well, that was Job. I'm not Job. Well, that's clear. <laughs> you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. One more verse and we'll bring it in for a close. I appreciate your patience. And we will have the prophecy update today. We'll be out of here about, I don't know, 2, 2.30, 3.00. John's Gospel 16, verse 33. I know you've heard this verse, but let's revisit it, shall we? I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, or tribulation as some translations render it, or trials if you prefer. In this world you will. I went into the original hoping to see the original Greek word for will maybe meaning more along the lines of if, you know, if by chance you should, you know, have trials. It doesn't say if. Uh, you will in the original language means you will have trials. But, and this is a good one, take heart. And here's why. I have overcome the world. You know what Jesus is saying? This patient endurance that doesn't just endure through it, but is triumphant over it, comes because I first was triumphant over it. I first overcame the world. I first, going through the suffering, triumph. And that's why you too can be triumphant and also overcome the world. I want to close with a word of encouragement. I offer this word of encouragement to those who today find themselves suffering in the midst of a fiery trial. The Lord may not get you out of it, as we oftentimes wish he would and pray he would. Lord... He's not going to get you out of it, but he will absolutely see you through it. You will not be overcome by it. 
you will overcome it. Let me say the same thing a different way. You will not be overcome by this trial. This trial, this temptation, as Paul says to the Corinthian church, chapter 1, or chapter 10, verse 13, no trial has overcome you or seized you. It will not overtake you. This will not take you down. You're going to overcome it. You will not be overcome by it. You will overcome it. You'll see. You'll see. Wait on the Lord. Wait patiently in your patient endurance and your triumphant overcoming. Wait for the Lord and you'll see. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. I, this is a... <laughs> any teaching on trials is one that always hits close to home. Our walk of faith in this world is riddled with trials and knowing, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan in and through those trials is that which we need to be reminded of. And Lord, we thank you for your word today that reminds us of this, a much needed reminder. Lord, please encourage and strengthen the hearts of any who are weary in the trial they're in. Encourage them with this truth that they will overcome it. In Jesus' name, amen.